My name is Joe Pesa. I was born in Cairo, Egypt, from a large family. I, we are all together five boys and two uh, girls. So I have two sisters and four brothers. How long was your family in Egypt for? Um, how long we lived in Egypt is questionable, but it is generations. Uh, we may have had uh, our ancestors coming from uh, Russia and uh, from Istanbul or uh, from uh, Israel. Do you have vivid memories of your grandparents? Yes, I do. Can you tell me some memories you have? My grandfather and grandmother were to me like saints. They were full of wisdom, and uh, they were not very rich. So they were humble, and I learned a lot of patience from them. Can you tell me about your mother? My mother have lived also a very difficult life, and she, she has two stories to tell me about her childhood when she goes to school and to see the other, the other kids, you know, well-dressed and then she cannot afford. And especially when she talks to me about the hole in her shoes and she was walking in the winter time and aching and is afraid to show her shoes so that, you know, she will, she will look uh, different than the others, or below the others' uh, levels. And how she was uh, content with little. And how, after her father died, she was still six years old. And then she asked about her father, they told her, he is in the mountains. Instead of telling her he died, he is in the mountains. And she really wanted to see because the cemeteries were in the mountains. So one day there was a bus and then gathering people to visit the cemeteries. And then the announcer was saying, "Who this bus is going to the mountain. Who is going there? She slipped in to see her father. And then people realized, who are you and why are you here? After the bus have departed. And then they brought her back to her, to her path. That's one, one story for my mother. The other one is how she got married. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the woman gives a dowry. And uh, the man doubles it on paper. So there is a, a pre-dowry and a post, post in case there is a divorce. So when a woman doesn't have money, you know, she, her, her, uh, her chances are less to marry a, a well-established uh, person. But, and my father was well-established. And then when he saw her, and then uh, he, it's a long story here. That's okay, sure. When, when he's, uh, actually she, he, he was a dentist. And, uh, one of the ladies wanted to marry him, and then she asked my mother to go with her. And then she wanted to take the opinion of my mother. But when my father saw both of them, he preferred my, my mother. And she was very surprised when he told her, how about you? Because she asked him, what do you think of this lady, separately? He said, how about you? She said, me? I am very poor. So he said, no, I am going to marry you. And from that time, my father established a society, a, a group, to help the women who want to get married, and they are poor. It's in his name. Yeah. So why was your father wealthy? Well, he was better to do than than uh, my mother's family because 
my grandmother from my mother's side uh, is the only one who works, who worked because she lost her husband. So, um, what did your mother do when you were growing up? What was her job? Her job is to take care of us and give, the, give us good advice mm -hmm. and to protect us. Uh, this protection was very important because as we were growing, the uh, anti-Semitism kept growing slowly. They knew about it, we did not feel at the beginning till, till we became young men and young uh, women. And uh, it was very difficult. I recall a, an incident where my father asked me to go and buy uh, some grocery from my uncle in, in the uh, quarter of the Jewish, the Jewish quarter. He had a shop, a grocery shop. And as I was going, I was very young. I was probably 12 years old or so, or 11. As I was going toward the grocery shop, a, a boy from, a Muslim boy, stood in front of me and then he stopped me from continuing to walk toward the, the grocery. So I turned back and I went running to my father and I cried. He told me, man, don't cry. Go back again. I went back again and I was very afraid to see the boy and I did not see him. But I was always fearful that something like this may, might happen when the mob turns against you. That was a scary part. Which kept, you know, growing and growing uh, by the time uh, nine, uh, by the time all the Jews have left Egypt. The other incident that affected me is the massive exodus of the Jews from Egypt. I had many friends. And I would sit in front of the balcony, I remember, and I see people early in the morning at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, carrying suitcases by hand, going to the station, the train station, that will take them to Alexandria, where they are going to be departing. Because they were kicked out or they could not find any any way to make a living. So my worry was to make friends because when I see a friend who is going to leave and I will not see him again, it affected me and uh, I decided not to have friends. Otherwise I lose them. And that continued for a long time in my, in my life. What did your father do for a living? Yeah, he was a a dentist means he uh, actually a dentist technician. Where did your family live? What kind of area did you live? We lived at the beginning, right across from the uh, Saint Joseph uh, School, and after that we lived uh, on a street called uh, uh, Farouk which have changed after that to El Gish, means the army street. And um, you said that your mother gave you advice. What was the advice she would give you? What would she say to protect you? you well, in two phases she was protecting us. One of them is not to tell us the bad news and delay it. And that had a negative effect on, on some incident that happened to me to my life. On the other hand, she was encouraging us all the time to, to succeed, to perform in, in school, uh, to take care of our health, like you know, a Jewish mother. And uh, the incident that affected me of the delayed, the delayed uh, bad news, it's a common, actually. De delaying the bad news is very common in the Middle East. 
uh, is when my brother died. I had a younger brother who died and we did not know. So early in the morning they told us to pack and then go to my aunt. And I went to, to my aunt and when I came back, first thing I did, I dashed to, to his room and I did not find him. So I told my mother, where is my brother Jack? So she told me he is gone to Europe for uh, for uh, getting you know medical attention and i was happy but i noticed that my mother and my grandmother would come in the daytime they will enter a room and they close the door and i hear them sobbing and crying and that was not something normal and i was afraid to ask to hear the bad news. And finally I told my mother she was sitting, she was laying on the bed and then tears were in her eyes. I told her, Mom, tell me the truth. What happened to Jack? She said two words, he died. in the anti-British riots that turned into horrible anti-Jewish riots in Cairo. I know you were very young probably, but do you have any memories of that? I, I have seen a subset of this riot um, when uh, the mobs came and tried to enter by force the school, the, which was across our home. St. Joseph School. This was also our school. Uh, and then they went, after that, the, the, the soldiers have barricaded the, the gate. They could not get in. And uh, they went after that, continue on the same street. And there were uh, liquor stores. And any, any shops that had uh, write-ups in, in English, was destroyed. Do you remember them chanting anti-Jewish? No. No. So do you remember when Nasser came to power, 1956, in the year of 1956 with the Suez Canal crisis? Yes. What do you remember from that year? Um, actually, before that year, in 1955. I remember when the Egyptians have uh, broken a, a ring of what they call spies for Israel. Uh, on their head was Dr. Moshe Marzouk and uh, I think Eliezer in Alexandria. Uh, Dr. Moshe Marzouk was in Cairo and uh, they were both hanged. And uh, this is also was very, very important milestone in my life that is very tragic. Uh, only recently, I found out that the reason I am phobic uh, uh, was that incident. You know, you cannot, a claustrophobic, you cannot stay in, in a, for, for breathing. Because I was figuring out all the time the moments he died by hanging. And I was reading how long he stayed, uh, because I always report how long his pulse was working. And, uh, you know, these are the small things that you discover later. But they may or may not be important to... To other people, it is. It was important at that time. So, when the anti-Semitism was growing and growing, how how did you practice being Jewish people? Did you have Shabbat? Did you go to synagogue? Yes, we go to the synagogue every day. Every day in the evening, we go to the synagogue. It was it was walking distance. That synagogue had you know all the memories that we had. The sweet part of of being in Egypt, the friends that we had, the retreats that we were taking for three months on the shore of Rasselbar, and meeting friends and dancing at nights, 
All these have left a very good taste of, of sweet, sweetness in our uh, mind. And we had a good life. But this good life, actually, we owe it to the ancestors because for generations, the Egyptian Jews have contributed to art, to the movies, to the economy, to every aspect of life. So behind us was a, a big force that was not an overnight, born overnight. It was for centuries, was the establishment. There were hospitals. Uh, well-known hospitals, and uh, that kept the momentum going even though the departure of the Jews was uh, relatively abrupt. Uh, and also the, the people were uh, doctors, were, many of them were accomplished businessmen, business, business men and women, and uh, it was a establishment and contribution for Egypt. Were you scared though, even though life was free in those good times, did you have fear still? Yes. These are the hidden things, the hidden fears. They don't arise now, and let's forget about them. But I, 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 one time I tell you a small story to show you what kind of discrimination happens. Clandestine discrimination. Um, I was in school and I, I am sure I was very, very talented in Arabic language. And I did the best I can to, to become number one in my class. Every week we get a report, I am number two. So one day, I have decided to monitor my opponent, or my potent, potent opponent, who comes number one, who his name was Muhammad Abdul Salam. And I saw that what grades he gets in the homework and kept track of them throughout the week. At the end of the week, I had a record of what I did and what he did. I came number two. So I went to the, to the teacher, Mr. El Gundi. I told him, I did the best I can. And I, I'm sure this time, without showing him the numbers, that I should be number one. He said, no, you can't. I said, why? He said, you are not Egyptian. And this is not your language. So how could you be number one? So at that time, I, I brought down my hands helplessly, and I say, what can we do? Did you have nationality at all? Uh, Egypt is uh, a secular country, and uh, very diversified, lots of foreigners, and those foreigners have been classified either stateless, means we do not know, and it's okay to be stateless, or carrying a foreign passport. Like you can buy a Tunisian passport. You can buy Espanol. So, and that is done, you know, under the table. But you end up finally with a passport in your hand. So, uh, most of the Jews were either stateless or having an Italian a, a, or a foreign passport, uh, British sometimes, and French. And these were the first one who has been uh, chased away from Egypt on a 24-hour basis, the French and the British ones. So uh, this is the diversification of, of the state. But they don't give you, if, even though you had many generations of uh, existence in Egypt and you are Jewish, you don't get automatically a Jewish nationality, a, a Egyptian nationality. So what was your status? 
Our status at the beginning was stateless, but my uncle convinced my father to hire a lawyer and obtain the Egyptian citizenship. We did, and which proved to be disastrous later on uh, for our faith, because when we were uh, in prison, it was an internal affair, and no one can interfere on our behalf. We are Egyptians. Did you have a bar mitzvah? Uh, the Karaim don't have a bar mitzvah per se, but the graduation is in the reading of the Torah every year. So it's not one year, and there is no celebration of, uh, of the sort that you, uh, you have seen here, or we have seen here. What about Shabbat? Shabbat is very strict. And what do you remember from your Shabbat, Shabbat in Egypt? Shabbat was uh, really, we felt the holiness. Because there is no cooking at home, we are rested, we walk to the synagogue, and uh, it was very important to have this this spiritual day and the food that comes with Shabbat and the aroma of of the uh, special special uh, za'atar, we call it za'atar and uh, the the stories that my mother will tell us when she reads the Bible for us so um what were some of the foods that she would cook on Shabbat? Well, she would cook food in the Karaite tradition, the food that you can eat and you don't have to heat, because the Karaite forbid, forbid even kindling uh, the fire before Shabbat to continue on Shabbat. So there were some kind of chicken, stuffed chicken, uh, which we liked, and there are some something called tagarines. Tagarines is some kind of noodle that is made out of egg and flour and very fine like hair, angel hair. And uh, some bamya, bamya is okra. And rice. Did the Karai Jews and the, the other Jews in, intermingle? Were they together? Okay. It depends on what time of, of history. At the beginning, the total separation. But in your time? Your in my time, yes, they did. We had friends. But except for, for marrying. Marrying was very seldom between Karaite and Rabbanite. So interesting. So yeah. Interesting. We, were, we had no problem of assimilation. In other words, Karaim were marrying Karaim, Rabbanite were marrying Rabbanite. The other side was different than us. You, you see what I mean? So assimilation was not a threat. The real threat was when, uh, uh, when you lose your religion. Like here in the United States? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I would say your affiliation to a religion. So can you tell me about uh, the, the war in 1967? And okay. The war in 1967 was prepared was felt on the street, trenches were dug, people were trained even at school to carry a, a gun. And it was a whole preparation, the whole country was prepared to wipe Israel. <clears throat> and when you live in Egypt and you see all this and you see how enormous is the um, the power that they have gathered, the Egyptians have gathered against Israel, you tend to believe Israel is going to be wiped out. So, on June 6, I think that's the day, early in the morning, We hear in the radio that Israel have attacked uh, targets around Egypt, or they said throughout Egypt. And that word is not something that they can use very easily unless there is some danger in it. Because a small country like this attacked throughout Egypt, and it was 
uh, they they specified the the uh, attack as being vicious. It was a vicious attack, means it was hard. So every hour they count the number of planes they have downed. And then I was asking me myself, so when is going uh, the the aviation the 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 Egyptian planes are going to attack? No word. So from the very beginning, I found that it was suspicious. What they say? Besides, they had the history of of lying on results of any attacks or any any combat between uh, between the two Egyptian the Egyptian army and the Israeli army. So I have just went with my brother in our room and closed the door and was sleeping in the morning. And then uh, my uh, my mother came to me after a while and then she said, wake up, wake up, they took your father. I said, what? I said, yes, they took your father, your uncle came with him, came with a, a bunch of people, and they were actually the Mabahis. al Mabahis al-Amma is almost like a CIA or, or the secret police, secret police. So they took your father, and then she kept crying. And uh, we were devastated, because I knew my father is loved by, by his neighbors, by everybody, and he had, you know, this respect and this, this uh, integrity that, you know, he will be out. But he has not been out. They told him a few minutes to interrogate you in the police headquarters and we'll bring him back. That's what they told my mother. It turned out to be that, you know, those three minutes were three years, lasted for three years later on. But what was important, they did not take us. If they have seen us, they would have taken us. My brother and I, because we were at, in, in university, Cairo University, uh, at, you know, an age where we were above 18, as a matter of fact, 22 or 23. So we stayed one month. We could not leave home because my mother was afraid that we will be attacked. And uh, after that, one day, uh, people knocked on the door and then they went in and they gathered me, my brother, and my uh, cousin, because in the time where we are afraid, the two families got together. We, I have to tell you that two brothers married two sisters, and that's my father, my mother, my aunt, and my, uh, my uncle. So the children were named the same almost, Joseph, Joseph. And, you know, Maurice, Maurice. All kinds of names are, are the same. But Pesach, all of them at the end. So uh, we lived together because she, my aunt left her home. She was afraid after somebody knocked on their door and then went to, to uh, the drawers and then picked up their, their jewelry and they said they belonged to the people. So she was very afraid from the mobs coming in. So we, we lived that month together in, in, our, in our home. They took us to the uh, headquarters of the interrogation. And along with this, they took two boxes. One of them was full of electronic parts, because I was an electronic engineering. And then the other one, my mother made sure they take it, for, belonging to my brother, it contained dead bones, because my brother was in medicine. So she insisted because she knew they are going to put a, a spy, a spy charge on me. And she wanted to tell them that this is part of his study. And the other one is part of his study is similar. That's what she had in mind when, when they took us. Um, 
So we went and we have been interrogated for over six hours and at the end of the interrogation, no charges. End of the interrogation, uh, I was sent to, I, I and my brother and my cousin were sent to the concentration camp. And I found one of my my friends at uh, Cairo University was also being interrogated with me. He was Christian, and then they asked him about my activity, and he defended that you know I have nothing to do with any spying operation. So we went there a month after they took surrounded all the Jews. And my father, who thought or had big hopes that we will not be arrested, saw us as we were going, walking through the corridor. And what they do to you at the very beginning, that the same, the same prison where the Muslim Brotherhood have been tortured. The first day to subdue you, they have to beat you in front of everybody. So that, and so that you keep screaming, and then you send all the terror through all the remainder of, of the people who are, who are imprisoned. So uh, we stay in that, uh, in that prison for about six months, and we have been transported after that to Torah, another camp. But it was next to the prison of Torah, where criminals are there, and they uh, at close proximity, and where also there was there Lutz uh, with uh, Israeli spy uh, that was arrested right before 1967. But we were with the Muslim Brotherhood. Since we were the same age, and, and we made friends with the Muslim Brotherhood, and I talked to their leaders, and I, I felt how they conduct their cells and how they support each other and how do they elevate each other uh, to high standards. Um, and one day my friend, the Muslim Brotherhood, told me, Joe, I see you very sad. Why? I told him, we haven't had any criminal activity. We don't deserve to be in prison. At least you, you try to topple the, the government, or you have plans to topple the government. But we, we did not do any of, of this. He said, Joe, listen to me. If my country has won the war, the war, I would have stayed here for the rest of my life, and I'll be very happy. So I learned from him something. But see how they believe. They actually wanted to believe that if the government of Egypt, which was secular then during Nasser, had adopted the Sharia, they wouldn't have had this big defeat in 1967. That's a proof for them. And uh, beside the torture that you know has been spoken for uh, for uh, at length in many situations, we were allowed after that to have a visit once a month. And uh, I want to give credit to my wife, who I knew when she was 14 years old, and she stayed with me all the time. And she tried to free me by going through the Red Cross and free the rest of the Jews. She was 19 and doing terrific work and never give up. I promised to marry her and I couldn't. But uh, she is very, uh, she accomplishes a lot of things. She said, if I cannot marry her, then she will marry me. How? She brought the rabbi to, to the prison. And she bought the wedding rings. 
and uh, I was on the other side of the bars, and we got married. No. We were the proof for their theory. The hatred is here when it comes to time, but for the time being, the hatred is against the government. They are going to take care of the Jews after. You know, they have a government that is according to the Sharia. And that was the last thing in Nasser's head. <clears throat> Yes. What did they make you do every day? Like, what, what was your average day in those three years? Okay. <clears throat> Devoiding your, your brain from any thought. Like, you are not allowed to, to have any newspaper, listen to the radio. Nothing. Total, complete void. And then some of the torture along this principle is... Uh, to come and ask you, is it morning or night? And then you say the truth, you get beaten. You don't say the truth, you get beaten. Okay, so they try to de defocus you. But we kept our, our mental health by challenging each other with everything that we learned at school, everything we learned in the university. We had people who were doctors still in in school, uh, in medical school, uh, those who have been engineers, you know, and then we try to, from scratch, try to, let's say, rhyme words. And then we challenge each other, going several steps in, in the game. Were men dying in the prison? Uh, one person died, uh, but not because of torture. <coughs> He was the oldest. He was 55 years old. He shouldn't have been there to begin with. So the, the Jews and the Muslim Brotherhood were in the same prison intermingling with each other? Yes. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Right. Some people were taken for 19 years. They took him from his seat at the wedding. At his wedding. That's the person that I, I mentioned before. They took him from his seat of wedding for a few minutes, and when you go there, they shave your head. Okay. Didn't, with the Muslim Brotherhood, I, I'm sorry, but didn't you understand that these are like Islamists, they're people who are not going to like you if they ever get their way? Yeah, but not now. Yeah. Right now, you know, their priority, as, as I, I mentioned, is to take care of the government. And after that, this is the, the way to establish Islam in the world. That's their mission. Their mission is, Islam. It means that the religion with God is Islam. It is not Jewish, it's not Christian, it's not Buddhist, nothing. So, you either convert to Islam, or, you know, it is dealt differently. How did you, like, did, were you closest in prison with your father and your brother? Did you stay near to them and protect each other if you could? What, in prison? Yeah. Uh, in prison, it's not a question of protection now. In prison, it's a question of, of being freed from prison. Uh, because uh, it was guarded and we were in in uh, collective cells, and some were in separate cells. But not, uh, the, the cells for the Jews were separate than the cells for the Muslims. Uh, I think this I want to make clear. But during, when we play, when we have a recess, okay, that's when we intermingle. Did you meet any of the, any people who are leaders now? Yes. Do you want to share who? Uh, I don't remember the names. I don't remember their names. But uh, it happened that I had an argument, uh, an argument with one of the leaders, and I, I said words that uh, uh, did not uh, fit in his rank. 
So uh, here I see every one I know from the Muslim Brotherhood trying to take me to him to apologize. And then, you know, hallowing him as being, you know, the, the highest authority and this should not be done. And, you know, you are younger than him, you should be the one who apologizes. And, and <laughs> well, why didn't you leave Egypt before 1967? Because of the hope everybody was saying things will get better. Same thing in Germany. Things will get better. And because anti-Semitism were being administered a little by little, it was not abrupt. So it was growing. And uh, that could poison you at the end. You die. But also another thing is uh, uh, among anti-Semitism is that if you graduate, you are not going to find a job in the government. So what do the Jews do? We were trained from the very beginning to have our own business. If you are a doctor, you're going to open your own clinic. If uh, you are a lawyer, you are having your own, your own clinic. If you are an engineer, you have your own uh, association and, f and fabrication uh, uh, f store or stuff like this. So, um, and if you are out of work, they will imp employ you. Jewish people who own these institutions will employ you. So they were compensating every time. people are good at taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. So, finally, how you left. Can you tell me about leaving? Yes. Uh, we lived first in uh, those three days in fake hope. There were people in prison and one person among them his name is David El Gamil. He would say to everybody, hey, there is very good news. I said, what it is? And he said, there is a big list in front of the commander of the camp, and it is for freeing the people, the Jews. Nothing happens. Same over and over, and people like to hear this, because they want to get be freed. So one day in the morning, we woke up. I see we sleep on the floor. Everyone have a certain dimension, not to exceed of space, and we sleep like sardine. And then he wake up, and then he said, "There is a big." I said, "Wait a minute, David. I call him Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood, you slept like we slept on the floor." Nobody moved. How in the morning you find that there is a list? And I was angry. So he told me, Joe, if I don't say this, how people young like you are going to have hope to be freed? I couldn't say a word. So we lived on hope. We were more free than the people who were imprisoning us. We had done so many services to the guards. Doctors were curing them and their families, were prescribing for them, you know, medicine. Uh, it was an amazing situation where they were coming to us so because the people, the caliber of those who have been imprisoned were not criminal, were innocent people, dealt with injustice. They were doctors, they were accomplished businessmen, they were lawyers, they were uh, engineers. Those had talents that uh, is free. A free talent for the guards who come and do an inspection, for instance. We have to have some inspections, and they remove from us what is not allowed. What is not allowed could be a radio, small transistor radio. 
could be anything that you know is forbidden uh, by by the law of the prison. So we were making for them, uh, we were giving them a lot of services, and they were respecting us, and they were letting us go with with many things that were not allowed. So we had our own way to survive in prison. And I had my spy in uh, in the commander. Uh, in the commander uh, office, they normally yes, yeah. and because of the talent that was uh, present among the uh, uh, Jewish uh, prisoners, uh, the guards would often come to them and ask them to to prescribe to the doctors to to prescribe medicine for their families and all that for free. And for every profession, they had the contribution, you know, given to to the, the poor guards who are getting very little payment for uh, our salaries. Um, my side was, uh, since I was an electronic engineer, or about to be, uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood. They would come to me with their little transistors, and uh, they wanted to listen to the radio of Israel, because they said it says the truth not like the Egyptian government radio. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the Egyptian government have put a, a noise uh, of interference so that nobody uh, to censor uh, that station and also to censor any station that speaks uh, about Israel. Uh, so my mission was to fine tune the, uh, what they call inside the IF transformers, uh, to detune them a little bit uh, away so that it emphasizes the side, the sides where you can eventually hear. And I do that by, by uh, experimentation. And they would take the radio, and the radio is also uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the of the objects that are not allowed. And they hide it, and they keep listening to the radio of Israel. The other thing is. Uh, when uh, the public address that addresses all the camp and the prisoners was going down, I would uh, be set out of my cell to go and fix it, and that gives me, you know, some fresh air, more than, uh, you know, all the other pr prisoners. Um, what was the space like in the prison? Was it individual cells or a big room like this? Yes. Uh, we sleep on the floor. You have a cover under you, as a, serve as a mattress, which is only a cover, a sheet, and uh, you uh, and you have you are given one one set of clothes and uh, one utensil for food, and uh, the food is uh, cooked inside the camp. Did you ever think that you were never going to get out? That is a difficult question. Because uh, there will always hope. And that hope have actually uh, hit me back because we were dreaming a lot. Dreaming that we are free. And when you dream you are free, you really feel that you are free. But if you wake up in the middle of the night and you see the bodies around you on the floor, you have the biggest disappointment that it was only a dream. What reverses the situation is when you are out, when you have been freed already, really freed, and then you dream that you are back in prison. And you wake up and you think it was a dream and you are still in prison. That is what hits people for several, several, several years. I had suffered from, from this illusion and I was really free, but I felt imprisoned to the past. So, how, so you got out of prison? So but, I got out, yes. So what, how did you get out and 
What happened right when you got there was story. There were stories uh, saying that the government of France have paid uh, Nasser per head. We do not know the truth. But finally, we were we were uh, set to leave, even though we carried the Egyptian nationality. They allowed us finally to decline the nationality and uh, go from prison directly to the airport, Air France. So it, it was amazing, you know, a, an abrupt uh, situation like this. But uh, that was one day where the truth came out that we are going to be really liberated. How did it happen? Uh, I said that I have some friends fro who are coming from, uh, who are prisoners uh, uh, from the civil, civil prison. And uh, they were really esteeming our talent and they like to be our friends. And they were doing minor work uh, like services, hired to do services for free, of course, part of the job because they are less. Uh, less dangerous than others. I let them out and then do clean up stuff like this. One of them was working, was cleaning always the room of the commander. And I asked him to tell me everything that goes on there. And he said, okay, he, the day he, uh, things are going to happen, he will let me know. And one day, we were all sitting in, in the cell, and then I saw him from outside, and uh, he signaled that he wants to talk to me. And I went, and then he said, the officers are discussing the release and how it's going to be done. And it is true. So I went and I made the announcement for the first time that we are going to be freed. And this is no, and I reminded everybody, I never said we are going to be freed, but this time it's going to be freed. And I was very proud to, to be the one who announced it. So when you left, did you take like a, a bus or who came and drove you to the airport? Did you meet your mother? What happened right when you got out? When we got out, and my mother had already left ahead of us, forced her to leave because there is no hope for us. We told her we are not going to come to the visit if you don't leave the country with my brothers and sisters. So she had to leave and Remy's father and mother took care of bringing us some food whenever possible. So my mother went to Italy and my uncle in, in, uh, in the United States the uncle of my father, told her, come over, don't have to worry about anything. We'll take care of you and your children. And the Jewish organization actually uh, worked to make us fit in this country. So the day of, they took you to the airport, the Egyptian government took you to have it. Tell me about the day you left. The day we were out, we left with uh, five dollars, the equivalent of five dollars, in our pocket. We were transported to the, the airport, and I met Remy at the airport. She was on the, uh, on the second floor, because they are not allowed to come close to us. And then she told me that she will be joining us, joining me, in a few days. So, I know she made fun of this. No. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, uh, I went to the airport. Uh, I went to the plane. And, you know, it was amazing that you sleep on the floor a few minutes, a few hours ago, and then all of a sudden, somebody is asking you, Café chocolat, monsieur? Do you want café? Yeah. And they give me tort and good stuff. We didn't have that stuff for years. And then we went to, to France, my wife, to be joined, and we got married again. The people of the, of the Hebrew, of the Hayas, 
heard about our story and they say we have to make you a wedding. So they made the celebration, we got married again. But my mother was upset. How my first son get married and I am not there, we have to make you another marriage when you come to, to America. So in all I was married three times just to make sure. <laughs> no, in prison we were not afraid. But we were afraid about our families and worried about them because they had no income and uh, they are subject to any harassment. The people were leaving sometimes without announcing to their neighbors that they are leaving. They just leave the key and they leave the home as is. Uh, these situations have happened many, many times where just let us get out in peace. Did you know what was happening in like Tripoli and in Tunis <clears throat> and in other parts of North Africa? Were you connected to the other Jewish communities? No. No. But we, we hear sometimes in the radio that there have been some murders. <clears throat> you were a Zionist? Were you a Zionist before 1967? Well, was I a Zionist? Well, what the definition of a Zionist is aspiring to be in Israel and supporting the state of Israel. Support, were you supporting the state of Israel? Anti-Semitism made us a Zionist even if you didn't want to be a Zionist. Anti-Semitism will make you a Zionist. So... During the war in 1967, you all just wanted Israel to, to win the war. Didn't, wasn't because they said they are gonna, they are gonna slaughter us. Yeah. They are gonna slaughter us, and it was known they are gonna eat Bahul Yahud. They are gonna slaughter the Jews. Any other questions? Just about the music, the music of the Jews and the music of the Arabs. The, how it's different and the same. And well, the, the Arabic music is very rich. And it carries in it some melodies from different places, including Turkey, which has been, you know, colonized by the Osmanim, by, by the Turks, Egypt. And it includes uh, uh, many, many different uh, uh, tunes. The uh, obviously the Karaite melodies are have adopted some of it and some of it from Russia, and uh, it's a mixture of, uh, of of these melodies as well, and it's appealing, you know, uh, because it goes along with the meaning of the of the words when we when we pray, for instance. Can you could you pray and sing in prison? Yes. Yeah. This is one thing. This is one thing they allow. Your religion, you pray. They don't like it, but you you pray. They don't interfere. Muslims were praying. Uh, Christians were pray, uh, Christians were play, praying, and Jews were praying also. And by the way, they also not only the brother, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, imprisoned. But uh, ahead of time, but there are also at the 1967, they picked up the Baha'im. And the first time I hear Baha'im, who, who are they? And they explained to me who they are. And amazing, they are more Zionists than anybody. The Baha'im believe that this war is the end of, of the world and the capital of all the world is going to be from the temple in Haifa, Carmel, on Mount Carmel. So they were pro-Israel, and Egypt doesn't like to see people, uh, you know, think uh, that Israel has won, and this is a prophecy. Is there one thing, is there a song that you can sing for us that you would sing in, in prison? That we were sing, singing in prison? Yeah, well, the, the songs that we have, uh, learned uh, in prison altogether is to say Hatikva. <laughs> yeah, because it was unknown to us. 
Hatikva was was brought by by some Ashkenazim, by some uh, Jews from Alexandria, and then we all sang it. Can you sing a song in the Karaite melody, something that's really a, from your community? Yes, but uh, since uh, I have to say the name of God, I have to wear a kippah. Okay. Is that good? <laughs> I'm going to say the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad And another one. And, and it's a supplication, a song for asking God uh, to deliver us. And now Adonai Yoshi, and now Adonai Aslihana. That's my favorite part of the interview. <laughs> Okay, so now to go back to the interview. Go back to the interview. So what was it like when you came to the United States? Was it difficult or easy to assimilate? Okay. Um, first, I, with your permission, I want to talk about the result, the end result. Yeah. What has happened? Here they took some people who had nothing to do with any activity against Egypt, they were the children of Egypt. And they have carried an injustice against them. By making their life bitter, by sequestering all their belonging, by erasing all the heritage that they have accomplished for generations, and by kicking them out, just because they want to retaliate. And they are retaliating against the people of their own. When we were in prison for three years and we wanted to leave and leave everything, just give us our freedom, Nasser wouldn't. Pharaoh was likened to Nasser, or Nasser was likened to Pharaoh, that he didn't want to let the people go. And now, the Egyptians have realized it was a mistake. So instead of apologizing, they come with an Islamist like Assam Aryan, and he says, we welcome back the Jews to Egypt. This is their land. They were born here. And at the surface, you think this is something that is make your life glad, even though it is impractical. Impractical because he wants us to live in the past, go back and live in the past, while we have already abandoned the past. We lived with the past and made our accomplishment in life and had found work in the United States or Israel or any place and have children and our children are having children of, of their own. So the reason why this is an impractical situation it's not only because it cannot be done it's also because it was malicious. Aryan himself have said the reason why is to make a space for every Jew who leaves Israel, one Palestinian will replace him. It's absurd. So he right there have contradicted this warm welcome at the beginning that seemed to be a true and leading to, to forgiveness. 
As a matter of fact, he doesn't have to ask for forgiveness because we have forgiven. And you know, if we didn't forgive, what would have happened to us? We would have been like the Palestinians today. Refugees begging for help, not proactive in our life, and life is passing by, and our children have seen parents who were not proactive, are not pro-life. What we did is, uh, is due to our upbringing, is due to our religion to leave, leave the past. Don't live in the past, but live with the past. We cannot return the clock backward. Ariane wants want us to come back and return the clock. What do I tell to my child? who has a child of his own, come and live in here, in a place where even the Camp David Accord is in question, even the Israeli embassy could be unprotected and the security is, is shaky, and I tell him, go and live in here. I cannot do that. I love Egypt. I had memories. The people are nice. But things are changing. Things are changing because they are developing weapons of mass destruction. My definition of weapon of mass destruction is not a rocket, is not a nuclear bomb. It is what you teach in school, what you propagate in the media about hatred. The unfortunate part for the Egyptians, they are going through that road. And I thought Egypt is more refined than, than just falling into that pit. I pray that they will realize in their senses that teaching hatred will end up with killing between brothers. So if I have two children and I teach them to kill others like they teach in, in uh, Palestine, they teach them math by killing how many Jews plus to learn additions. If I teach them this hatred and then one of the two children have a fight with his brother, what do you think they are going to do? They bring the gun and kill him. That is what's happening in the Arab world. The hatred has been going along and we have not been paying attention to the weapons of mass destruction. It's in here, in your brain, what you teach your children. So, to conclude, is it a happy ending? Or is it a happy beginning to be out of Egypt? It is happy, of course, but sad. Sad because we are seeing our friends in Egypt fighting. And the killing is, is continuing to, to preside. And we pray for them. We want to see two countries next to each other living in love and peace between Egypt and Israel because we love Egypt and we are destined to Israel as our, uh, our final land and the land of our real freedom for the future. Thank you. Thanks. That was